The chapter on Ethiopian Jews in Israel really helps us see um, kind of like the margins and, and therefore the fault lines in an imagination of what constitutes Jewishness. Clearly both the Declaration of the State of Israel and the Law of Return are written against Arabness, um, imagining Jewishness and Arabness to be mutually exclusive. So to begin with, um, this isn't actually true. There are a lot of Arab Jews, many who were living in the land of Israel uh, even before Zionists started immigrating, but also throughout North Africa and the Middle East. Um, so Yemenite Jews, Moroccan Jews, um, Iraqi Jews, which are one of the biggest groups, um, Jews from just from really all over, um, North Africa and the Middle East are saw themselves as Arab Jews. They were Arabic speakers or they spoke Judeo-Arabic, which was close to Arabic, written with the Hebrew alphabet, um, similar to how Ladino and Yiddish work, um, that they're written in uh, the Hebrew alphabet, but, but used for a language that has a totally different heritage and totally different grammar system and totally different orthography. Um, and they were very connected to those identities, in particular before Zionism. So as, as Ashkenazi Jewishness was constructed against both European Christianity and then Middle Eastern Arabness, this really left a lot of Jews out because they weren't necessarily concerned at all in the role of Europe in their construction of their identity, and they didn't see themselves as, as not Arab, as not kind of part of the same ethnic heritage of their Muslim and, and Christian neighbors. So that's really the first main issue in the State of Israel, is the tension between Ashkenazi identity and then Mizrahi identity, these um, Arab Jews living throughout. North Africa and the Middle East. Um, so Mizrahi is just the Hebrew word for Eastern. It's a pretty late term um, that came to be used to distinguish these Jews from other Sephardic Jews that often uh, Jews in the Middle East get lumped in as Sephardic Jews, but they don't necessarily speak the same language. They don't necessarily have the same um, cultural heritage, patterns of migration, networks for business and halakha, all these kinds of things. So it's really um, created as a way of owning um, for them their, their Jewishness and seeing it as distinct from being Ashkenazi. At the same time that it's also a way of seeing them from the perspective of Ashkenazim as basically lesser Jews, that while um, Middle Eastern Jews were seen as kind of relics of the biblical period, and so basically a part of Jewish Orientalism, even toward other Jews, uh, that Jews were often the object of Orientalism, as were um, Arabs and Muslims, uh, not all Muslims being Arab and not all Arabs being Muslim. Um, but the two categories were frequently collapsed as part of Orientalism and as part of a way of people coming from Europe as seeing themselves as very, very different uh, from people indigenous to the Middle East. So there's a lot of tension in the early state of Israel over um, Ashkenazi versus Mizrahi Jewishness. And then ultimately, um, this case with Ethiopian Jews brings ideas about ethnicity and race to the surface, right? So Jewishness in Israel is necessarily not really ethnic. It's national, but um, it's not like in the U.S. where Jewishness is an ethnicity, that instead in Israel there are many different ethnicities, that the idea of being a German Jew really holds on for a lot of people of being a Russian Jew, whether it's from early migrations from Eastern Europe or from much later migrations um, that begin in the 70s and 80s of Jews from the Soviet Union.
Um, so those kinds of things attach. But those are all Ashkenazi Jews at the end of the day. However, um, Mizrahi Jews are, are treated as second-class citizens, and then we have this whole thing blow up with Ethiopian Jews. So as you read, um, Ethiopian Jews were discovered um, living in Ethiopia by Christian missionaries in the 19th century, right? So they're they're not discovered in the sense that, like, they didn't know they were there, right? That's already kind of um, imperialist, colonialist language to say they were discovered. But they were discovered to white Christian missionaries in the U.S. and Europe. Um, and people immediately said, these, these Ethiopians, there are Ethiopians who practice really, really differently from others, and that they live basically according to the Hebrew Bible. Uh, and so they were perceived as Jewish very quickly. Jews were happy to claim them um, in part because it sort of, um, especially for Zionists, it was a way to say that Zionism wasn't racist uh, because look, they were including these, these black Jews. That was kind of a revelation too for Ethiopian Jews who had never considered themselves black before. There were much different ways of thinking about ethnicity in Ethiopia, that black was a, a sort of certain class of Ethiopians that was at the bottom of the social hierarchy. They saw themselves as above blackness. And so to suddenly be labeled as black by outside eyes um, was really uh, shocking and difficult and, and continues to be that way in Israel today. Uh, so it Jews see Ethiopian Jews as Jewish, but then again, similar to what I discussed with the law of return, or like basically as an extension of the law of return, the question becomes, even if many Jews see Ethiopian Jews as, as Jewish, and as Jewish enough to come to the state of Israel, does that mean that the Orthodox rabbinate will see them that way? It was a very, very long debate, as we saw. Ultimately, the argument is made that they're part of the lost tribe of Dan. So if we look back to when we're thinking about the ancient Israelite kingdom, um, there was an idea that there was a tribe of Dan, um, and that this is one of the lost tribes of Israel. So there has to be an ethnic argument for how these are Jews, but because they're from Ethiopia and they haven't been connected to even the practice of rabbinic Judaism, much less contemporary practices of Judaism, they don't look like Ashkenazim, Sephardi, Mizrahim, nothing. They're totally different, and yet they look Jewish, both to Jews and to non-Jews, because of their practices. The state makes an argument through this kind of idea of a biblical ethnicity, of, of going that far back in time to make some kind of biological connection. However, even after they arrive in the state of Israel, then there's the question of practice. And it's one that doesn't get imposed on anyone else. Indeed, many Ashkenazim, as I said, move to the land of Israel because they don't want to practice halakha, or they get there and they're thrilled to be free of it. For others, it remains really meaningful. And part of what's wonderful about the land of Israel is that they can practice Orthodox Judaism however they want, um, without fear of retribution. Uh, and there are all kinds of immigrants who are basically just ethnic Jews, or maybe cultural Jews, but that they're not paying attention to halakha at all. And then suddenly, even as, Ethiopian, oh, even as Ethiopian Jews are determined to have a kind of ethnic biological heritage connection, they're told you practice the wrong way, you need to learn the correct way to practice Judaism. And so Ashkenazi halakha becomes normative for determining what Ethiopian Jews have to do. So of course the government can't really totally enforce this on Ethiopian Jews um, for being there in the land of Israel, they've gone, they've airlifted them um, en masse from Ethiopia, but um, it is an issue for getting a kind of full citizenship, and then um, especially for other things like marriage, um, that Ethiopian Jews are required to practice differently and even to do Orthodox conversions. 
um, so it's very strange, to name them as Jews, almost insist that they need to be airlifted to the state of Israel, and then once they're there, see them totally differently and as not really Jewish, um, or as not Jewish in the right way um, for m the majority of the state of Israel. So uh, Ethiopian Jews experience this kind of religious discrimination in terms of policy from the state, but also a social racism. Um, that while the concept of Ethiopian Jews may have been one that was very important for seeing Jewishness and Israeliness as something that crossed racial boundaries, in practice, these are still people who their idea of themselves has been constructed in a world of race. They see Ethiopian Jews as black and as lesser, and ultimately treat them even worse than Mizrahim. Um, and so I think we have to see that Ethiopian Jews and Mizrahim are all basically part of a debate for hegemonic Zionists, that is Zionists who have the control, who decide what's the right way to be a part of the state. Uh, who are basically Ashkenazim. Um, and, and we see this really explode in terms of the distrust of Ethiopians, um, uh, the, the racism that's going on with the blood donations that um, Israel uh, is a place with a universal draft. The military is very important. Blood drives are a big part of that. Um, and so Ethiopian Jews wanting to be good patriots um, donated a lot of blood. And it turned out that the state of Israel was throwing out their blood all along as contaminated, that without testing it at all, just all of it was being thrown away, right? And so this idea suddenly that they have bad blood that's not good enough um, for the state and for citizenship, this for many people is undeniably racist for one thing, but also really recalls the kind of language that we see from European anti-Semites and the Nazi regime in particular. And so it created a very, um, necessary total, um, surface level, which is to say like explicit discussion of race, of the treatment of Ethiopian Jews, of the way that Israeliness is imagined in general, um, that, that really confronted what does it mean to see people as Jewish, to um, invite them as citizens under the law of return, but then to really have this tiered society where um, Ashkenazim are at the top, Mizrahim are kind of in the middle, and there's even an internal hierarchy there, and then Ethiopian Jews are at the bottom, and begin to even question if it was good to come to Israel in the first place, because either they've had no economic improvement, or in fact they've had a very explicit economic um, sort of demotion, and Moreover, they're being treated in overtly racist ways by both the state and their and their Israeli neighbors. So um, I think that when we look at all these different groups, we see that there's like this shifting concept of Jewishness, and it's actually really hard to define. And it becomes a totally different um, can of worms once there is policy, once there's a state regulating Jude Jewishness and Judaism versus the United States, for example, where it's totally decentralized.